Um, I wanted to bring some attention to a article that I saw uh, via a site called Air Mail. Air Mail. I'll be able to say this. Air Mail News, and it is a um, columnist, actually a author named Howard Blum did this article on the Moscow murders. And Howard Blum is a best-selling historical author. And it says in his bio here, Howard Blum writes history books that read like thrillers. Uh, quote from the New York Times, the spy who knew too much is now available. So if you want to check out that book, you can. And the article that I'm going to bring up, <clears throat> which I wanted to focus on where, you know, wondering if this article or just some of the information from DM, one of the surviving, uh, surviving victims in the King Road residence on the night of, uh, of the murders, you know, she was the one that said that she saw Koberger walk past her. And and this article is phenomenal. If you, if you want to read it, I'm going to drop it down here in the chat. I'm just going to kind of poke through some of it this evening. But if you get a chance, go over. All you got to do is put in your um, email address, and then you'll have access to the article itself. And <clears throat> this is part one of the article. And then there's uh, going to be a part two that's released. So if you're on the email list, you'll get the part two. And obviously, when that comes out, we're going to discuss that here. So it says, the eyes of a killer baffled by a gruesome murder of four University of Idaho students. Investigators put all-out call for help. Thousands of tips pour in, as well as one very promising lead. And I'll read through some of this. Suppose you wanted to kill someone, that would be easy. There would be lots of ways. But suppose you wanted to kill four people, all in the same house, all within moments of one another, and you choose to use a knife. That could help eliminate the noise, but would require skill, strength, and endurance. Murder is hard work, especially if people fight back. Then there's a really big obstacle. You want to get away with it. You're determined to stab four people living in a single home in the still of the night, then disappear without leaving a, leaving a clue to your identity. Now that's a more difficult challenge, but you did it. You have everybody stumped and it's the perfect crime. And that's something that I talked about too, <laughs> you know, when this happened, that I felt like this was a specific person that was trying to pull off the perfect crime. And as we know, you know, Koberger was in school <clears throat> um, for uh, forensics and crime and, and investigation. He wanted to be, it looks like he wanted to be a cop. Um, you know, so I felt like he was just tuning his brain up to all this stuff to, to try to pull off the, uh, the perfect crime. Um, I want to get a little bit deeper into this article a little bit. Uh, let's see. I don't really want to, it's a very long article. I'm not going to read all of it, um, but let's see. And then a heavy quiet, uh, and then in the heavy quiet of the new Sunday morning, four young corpses, all students, all friends were found hacked to death in their beds in pale clapboard house, little more than a stone's throw away from the heart of the university campus. There was so much blood, it had seeped through the wooden floors and run down the building's gray concrete foundation in jagged red. <clears throat> it wouldn't be until nearly seven tenths week later, uh, seven tenths week later, an early morning raid by a police SWAT team thousands of miles away from the crime scene, finally arrested a suspect, Brian Koberg, 28, doctoral candidate of criminal justice criminology department of Washington State University, was pulled from his parents' home in rural Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania and charged with four counts of first degree murder and one count of felony burglary. Yet, 
Even with the rest, mysteries remain. Neither reasons nor motives have been revealed that would explain the horror that ended four lives. And in the unhealed aftermath, the remains of armory of fear, 25,000 people in a one seemingly uh, Binocal town nestled in the rolling snow sweeping Idaho hills, still alert of suspicious neighborhoods seared by a mystery of four perplexing deaths, victims who have left them victimized too. Um, let's see here. Later, when it became necessary to fix blame on the initial confusion over the gravity of the situation, fingers in the Moscow Police Department pointed in dispatcher. But the truth is that the best dispatcher was simply followed procedure. And this was about the um, unconscious person call. Um, so this kind of could probably get in a little bit of that. If you haven't heard it, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of controversy over that. Why was the call, you know, put in as an unconscious person when you clearly have four slain people in a house? So it says all the new, all the towns, 9 calls routinely routed to Pullman about 10 miles west of Washington State and home to Washington State University, where they handle all the civilian employees and municipal agencies <clears throat> called uh Whitcom 911. The calls come in from a local uh, Whitman in uh, Estonian counties, as well as city of Moscow, two universities in total of about 42,000 students and 70 additional municipality and uh, county agencies. In the dispatch, crews, local newspaper reporters severely understaffed. The over overtime schedule often added up to a grueling 20 hours each week. In fact, the dispatchers guild has complained that our ability to uphold public safety is a risk. So obviously they're all overworked over, uh, you know, way overworked and things get only getting, uh, going to get worse football week. And therefore when the callers, uh, let's see, okay. So there's, Here's the unconscious person. Unconscious person is one of the standard catchphrases. It can mean precisely what it says, or it can be shorthand for something more honest. My whole thing on unconscious person is that is to get emergency crews running and working fast to get into that area that needs help. It's the way I kind of see it. Uh, I know there's been a lot of controversy o over this. Um, why was it, it called in as an unconscious person, but I, I don't think there's anything, I don't think there's anything deeper there to look into maybe. Um, but I tend to believe that's just kind of get shit moving, trying to get people in that area responding quickly, you know, get an ambulance there and whatnot. So it says it was 1158 AM on Sunday, November 13th, 2022, when the no notification of unconscious person at a residence of 1122 King Road, Moscow was passed on uh, to Sergeant Shane Gunderson. Gunderson, who was on that day midway through a 12 hour shift that had started at 6 AM was running the operations division at the sparkly uh, monoristic and had opened barely 11 months earlier, Southview Avenue Police Headquarters. Uh, let's see. It kind of goes back into his history a little bit. Uh, it was a quick trip to the road leading the university neighborhood. The Sunday were empty in all the class. Uh, as the classrooms. And as soon as Gunnison black and white cruiser pulled up behind the neat row of car parked cars in the driveway uh, of the uh, austere, uh, I'm not even going to try that because I'm going to probably cat, uh, can't livered house on King road. He immediately, and I believe me, I'm a stutterer. I can't read for crap. So bear with me on King road. He immediately knew something was very wrong. It, it was the noise. There wasn't anything. Just an eerie, unsat, unnatural silence. A cluster of young people, university students, presumably were milling outside the open front door of 1122 
like gulls on a beach, and yet they were exceptionally quiet. They weren't merely subdued, they seemed stunned and as if drained by the deep and intense shock. When three mystified officers approached the front door, someone in the crowd, it would later be shared, muddled a single, single plaintive word, dead. Still Gunnarsson would confess to others he was unprepared for the strong smell of blood that rose up his nostrils the moment he walked inside. This is what's really strange to me. And, and, you know, and this is, I know there's been a lot of, you know, people saying, oh, you can't get on DM. You can't talk about the surviving roommates, BF, DM, BF, DM. I got a problem with all of it. If there's this strong smell of blood and there's blood everywhere and the night prior you see a person clad in black fucking walk past you you've never seen them you're shocked you're scared they leave out a sliding glass door why are you not fucking calling the cops i don't get it So it goes on to say the coroner who once been an emergency room nurse in the early stages of her life would describe the scene in the press interviews as chaos, lots of blood. Few others would even attempt to put into words what they saw. There were moments cops will tell you that are too profound, too unnerving to be experienced in the present. All you can do is move forward. There will be time later to try to make sense of it all. Procedures take uh, proceedings and it allows protective membrane to stretch between the real to the to and to real. All other thoughts, all other feelings become strenuous. There was so much blood and it seeped through the wooden floors and run down the building's gray concrete foundation in jagged red. <sighs> and so Gunnison and two other officers, largely mute, almost robotic in their movements, now stepped carefully across the blood streaked wooden floor and proceeded into, uh, into inspect the crime scene. Wedged against the hill, the house rose up three distinctive levels from a platform base, kind of like an ancient Persian uh, I'm not, zig ziggurat. The officers set out to inspect each floor. They moved cautiously, not knowing what they find. Yet, of course, by now, they knew. The first floor, nevertheless, was a surprise. There were two bedrooms. And when they anxiously entered one, there were no signs of any out the ordinary. Later, they would find to learn the two university student occupants, Dylan Mortensen and Bethany Funk, Funk, Funky or Funk, had apparently slept obviously through the carnage. I just, I don't. I don't get it. I don't get it. And, you know, and this is where. You know, you find out, and we're going to find out in this, that Dylan said one thing, then she changed her mind, and then didn't, didn't say anything, and then more things started to open up. If she's used in court as a witness, the defense could say she's a liar. There's holes in her story. And why the hell is the police being called at nearly almost noon the next day? So it says, apparently they slept, uh, slept obviously through the carnage. It was then explained that made no sense unless one's life had been informed by the experience of being a college student who curled up in bed after a long night of drinking. However, 
As the staggered day, day wore on, Mortensen would reveal more about what had happened that night. So at first she wasn't saying anything. And now she's saying more. And then the story changes. You know, and this is like everybody, oh, you can't get on her. You can't, you can't this. I have an issue with a lot of stuff that went on in the house. The night of the murders. The day after. I have a lot of fucking issues with it. She told authorities that she heard crying, opened her bedroom door and saw a mask, saw a man in black clothes and a mask walking past her. Frozen and in shock, she stood immobile as he headed towards a sliding glass door at the back of the house. And then impickently, she returned to her room and locked the door until the morning. What are you doing? If you are seeing someone, in, how do you not, you know, they're saying that the, the, the smell of blood was so strong. Now, I, I'm not a... I'm not a, a person in forensics. I don't know how much, how long it takes uh, the smell of blood to get into the air. And, and I would never want to experience anything like that. But I don't know. Would you smell that right away? Did you not smell that? Did you not, you know, you have a strange person that's now walked past you that you've never seen? And I get it. A lot of people have said, oh, well, you know, there's a lot of activity that happened in and out of the house. People are coming and going all the time. But if you're in a fro, if you're frozen and in shock, that probably would set off my, my, my sensors there. Maybe we should call the police. Maybe I should call a friend. Maybe I should fucking call up to my roommates and say, hey, is everybody all right? Well, how about I get up and go check on them? So obviously this person scared her enough for her to go back in her room and lock her door. I just don't know why it's not connecting. Why is it not connecting? Why is it not connecting to call the police? I don't get it. So uh, it goes on to say she stood immobile, headed towards the sliding glass door in the back of the house, and then inflictively returned to her room. She wasn't in her room. And there was reports that she was in her room. This is saying that she wasn't in her room. But in the daylight, things turned frantic. Morton and Mortensen and Funk first stirred from their beds sometime after 11 they found the impossible to ruse their roommates and called friends for assistance so what are you doing are you fucking just yelling up to them or did you actually get up and physically look at them and if you got up and physically looked at them obviously you would see what happened in the house let me get to this chat real quick I got Wings in the chat. Wings, how are you? Good to see you as well, man. Thanks for watching. Smell of blood isn't very noticeable to most people unless they know or they're aware of it, uh, what it is. Thanks for letting me know that, man. Like I said, I didn't know. I don't know. You know, I'm not a police officer or someone that, uh, you know, analyzes forensics. Um, but I didn't know. I mean, I obviously never been around uh, you know anything like that so I, I I wouldn't know but thank you thanks for clearing that up man um they found it impossible to ruse their roommates and call friends for assistance this is what I have an issue first to this is where I have an issue this is what I have an issue right now why are you calling friends why are you not calling 911? I mean, what are you doing? Are you in your room? And you're like, hey, everybody wake up and no one's getting up. So I'm going to call some friends to come over. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. <clears throat> Daniel, thank you for the emails. I'm sorry. I've not <laughs> gotten to them. But let's see what you guys say. Say, pay attention to the story of the sheath and note in the police report that BK never goes up to the third floor. I will definitely look that over 
And I definitely will cover that um, on one of my shows. I know you have sent me a lot of information. I really do appreciate it. You've emailed me. I have not, uh, I haven't, I'm not ignoring you. I just had a lot going on in my home life and work life uh, over the last couple of days. And then also, uh, if you guys don't know, I actually was on a smaller channel and I kind of transferred over all my uh, material about the uh, Idaho uh, murder cases. And I've been actually re uploading my catalog. So I've been very busy with that. But I will look over your emails and I promise I will respond to you. I promise I will. Um, so thank you. Thank you for all of that. And thank you for being here tonight. If you guys can go down and just hit that uh the upvote button down there, that little thumbs up, just click that. That'll help get this out uh, in the algorithm. So I have Wings also chiming in really quick. He says, often a witness statement, unless it is gained within the first 24 to 48 hours, will be very different than what forensics will come across. A lot of the outside influences come into play. That is from experience. And he said, great job, B, nonetheless. Thank you so much, dude. Yeah, we're in a different direction over here on the Opinionated Idiot YouTube channel. I know you've been around for quite a long time, and it's really good to see you, man, and uh, hear from you. I I'm hope you are well, and I hope everything is going well for you, man. Thank you. Thank you for the chat. I appreciate that. You guys can go down. Please hit that thumbs up button. I appreciate it. I would would appreciate it. It gets me out in the al algorithm, man. All right, so let's move on here. So it says, um, it says, Sorry, I lost my place in the article. Uh, so they got assistance. And in the torrents of confusion after the friends have arrived, one of their cell phones was used to make a 911 call, the result of an unconscious person. We've already talked about that. You know, maybe there's, you know, I don't know what's going on and my friends won't get up and da 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 and hysterics. So they just put it in as the unconscious person call. And that was a lot of the controversy where. Clearly, if you're visually looking at someone and you see what had happened and there's blood involved and, um, you know, obviously they wouldn't be unconscious, they would be dead. And there was a lot of controversy over this particular call. Um, I'm not going to go too, too much more into this. As I, that was really the, the main part of the article that I wanted to get into. And again, this is a fantastic article. If you want to go over and read it, I'm going to drop that in the chat for you guys. <clears throat> if you want to check it out, just going to go over, put your email address in, and you'll be able to read over the article as well. There was a couple of other things I wanted to go into really quick before we close up the stream. Uh, let's see. So we have... Oh, this here. On the third floor, things... Uh, on the third floor, things got, if impossible, worse. In one bedroom, lying in the single bed, were two inert women, Maddie and Kaylee. They might have been... Sisters so similar, they were 21 years old, pretty Barbie doll-like sculpted figures, their long cascade of thick streaks, oh, excuse me, of blonde falling down in uh, to the narrow shoulders. Yet in death, there were one gruesome differences. Kaylee, it would be reported, had been hacked in a particular, uh, with particular ferocity. It was if it was a wild assailant or it was assailants. And that is another question that has come up. You know, was there more people involved? And there was a, a, I was reading a, an article that was trying to make some connection that when Koberger was arrested, uh, not arrested, when Koberger was traveling back through Indiana, and we know of the two uh, body cam footages, the both times he was stopped, one of the stops, they talked about the, uh, the day at WSU, <clears throat> ironically, on the day that they were leaving, there was some there with a gun, and I believe that they had got killed and they were trying to make a connection was Koberger and this person working together um because it's just very ironic and very strange and i'm sure that that's being looked into as well um real quick i have uh, some chats going on up here <clears throat> um wing says i think uh once of i think once of one of the issues faced 
with the witness was the initial shock of the crime scene. Most people enter a stage of flight or fight uh, where reality comes into question. They feel that if uh, it was not real, but then again, small uh, police departments and the scale of the crime presented is a very difficult task for investigators. And then Elle is saying wings, but she hadn't seen the crime scene yet when she locked the door. She, yeah, the, yeah, I don't know if you know, man. She literally came out, saw this person clad in black, leave through the, the slider glass window and literally went back in her room, locked her door and went and and she said she was scared, went to bed. And then now it takes almost 12 hours later between that time and that to call the police. I have an issue with that. Um, <clears throat> have an intent on, on, had been, uh, let's see, where were we? It was as if a wild assailant or assailants had been intent to gouging out chunks of her flesh. Large punctures was how the lacerations had been described. Maddie's wounds, while uh, no less fatal, appeared less feral, more measured, and at least in comparison. Across the narrow hallway was the final door. The police officer pulled it open and at last discovered a sign of life, a fluffy caramel colored dog. It was Murphy, Kaylee's frisky labradoodle. Uh, he was unharmed, not married, not mared by even a speck of blood, a uh, small contusion, and barely one of that <clears throat> for after they have seen um, were only the beginnings of the process. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice a little bit here. It was another part of the article I wanted to read too. Okay, so it goes on to say, Gunderson quickly called his boss, Captain Roger, uh, Roger Lanier, the head of 24 officer operation division. He found him not unexpectedly for a Sunday sitting down to lunch with his family. Lanier was a veteran cop. A veteran cop. He spent more than 20 years on the force nearly uh, nearby Lewiston, Lewiston before having been lured uh, six years earlier to Moscow with the captain's rank. After all his years on the job, he had been steady uh, steady presence, bald headed guy, da, 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 da. but Gunnarsson reported left him on nerve. It took me a second. He recalled a sharp edge, even weeks later to the memory. I really had to think about it. Uh, what I had just heard four members of Moscow, Idaho was so out of character. Um, let's see. Mm -mm -mm. Now they're just alerting the stool, the students. Um, let's see, on the day leading up to the 12th. It's really interesting too, I, in this article I read that Fry did some training, FBI training, um, prior to what happened in Moscow. And it's interesting. It goes here too. It says three years earlier, Fry had been chosen to attend a 10 week course at the FBI's national training Academy in uh, Quantico, Virginia. Uh, he was on the cusp of turning 50. He was impeding a milestone. He, uh, he'd, um, confide to his close friend. He triggered a soul. It was, he had triggered soul searching. He wanted to prove that even, uh, that he acknowledged in, individually of his soon becoming a senior citizen. It's interesting that he, you know, it's interesting that, you know, he went to that FBI 10 week course. I'm sure he probably made some friends there. And, and, you know, as we know now that the FBI was involved, uh, in this case. Love the chatter, guys. I love the chatter in the chat. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. <clears throat> um, let's see. It looks like you got a certificate there, and it says it was his first talk, and we talked about his time with the FBI. Um, let's see. Gives you some background of the officers that were involved first there. Um, 
a lot of frustration over the first couple of weeks that we weren't hearing anything. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the white Elantra. So again, this is a, it's a very lengthy article. I'm not going to get, uh, read through the entire thing, but it's, it's a great read. I think you guys should go through it. I just wanted to highlight and I'll drop that article again. I wanted to highlight going over, you know, the, the issues that I had with the surviving roommates, uh, especially DM, you know, and, and just talking about how, um, her uncertainty or her not sharing information right away could potentially uh, work in the defense of Koberger. And I said, like I said, if they get him, if they get her up on that stand and they start really peeling back in her statements, uh, her state of mind, um, you know, they really could make her look and say, hey, look, you're lying. You know, you're lying. And uh, that could be admissible. You know, maybe her her testimony uh, just gets thrown out. So remains to be seen, you know, I'm definitely gonna be following this closer and just a lot of these weird, uh, paradigms that are coming into this, uh, case and all the connections. And, you know, you always hear those connections about small time life, how close really people are. And it's just so weird and the anomalies that are coming up and all the connections, but, uh, definitely something that I'll be following, of course, up until June, because it almost seems like every day there's new information that's coming out every day. There's a new, you know, witness or, or someone that's speaking or not witness, I'm sorry, or someone that's speaking that's, that may know, um, you know, a little about, about this case and the news, I'll tell you the news, uh, news nation and law and crime network have been really getting, uh, some really great information to us about what's going on in that area because we can't really be there. Um, at least I know I can't be down there to report not at this, this point in my juncture in my life, but I'll continue to, uh, to read articles, dig up some information and get it all out to you guys. So, um, we're close to, wow, this went time went when, uh, went fast. We're at about an hour and a half mark. I see some more people coming in right now. I appreciate you coming over and checking out the live stream. Guys, let you know, I am monetized on this channel. So Super Chats are open. I have memberships down below. If you hit the join button, that helps support this channel on a monthly basis. And I think I have a, uh, let's see. I have memberships that are $2 monthly, really would help out five or $10. You can subscribe there down below. Make sure to hit the thumbs up button on the way out because that really does help push this along in the algorithm but it is getting to be about 10 p.m over here on the east coast i'm gonna wrap this one up for now what i want to do is let you guys know what i usually do is i download these episodes and i relaunch either parts or the full episode the next day to get it out into the algorithm I'll usually trim these up in a clips and you can go back and watch those as well. But I'm going to get on a regular schedule soon of <clears throat> uh, doing some live shows. I used to do Sunday nights at nine o'clock. Maybe I'll go back to that. Maybe I'll do, um, you know, these midweek shows. The Wednesdays are always usually pretty good. Um, but yeah, I appreciate everybody. And again, I got a lot of stuff you're going to hear a lot on this case. Some other cases going on. I know I just talked about Alec Baldwin's case the other day. And, uh, you know, we'll keep following stuff like that. You'll see political uh, stuff over here as well. And, uh, you know, maybe I'll get some rants out there <laughs> as well. But I appreciate everybody tuning in this evening. I'm going to wrap it up. There's a lot of conversation in the chat. I love it. You guys are great. And uh, come back over. I always post the show announcements. You can go in and hit the uh, the the reminder and come over and join the live shows and we'll, uh, we'll have a, we'll have a good time over here. So with that being said, like I always say, opinions are like assholes and everybody's got one. I'll see you guys on the next one. I appreciate all of you guys this evening for tuning in. See you in the next one and wrap this one up. P -p 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 Peace. <laughs>